Welcome, everyone. Now, uh, let's get started. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Eric Schmidt's a graduate of Princeton, class of 76. He went on to grad school. Yay! <laughs> Uh, he went on to grad school at Berkeley and worked at Xerox Park and Bell Labs, Sun Microsystems, uh, and eventually wound up at a small startup that maybe you heard about. Uh, Eric arrived here in Princeton in 1972, uh, which is interesting because it was about 40 years ago, uh, in about 40 years after Turing was here, and the midpoint between Turing and today. As Andrew will explain tomorrow, there's a straight line from Turing through people like Eric to today's students and into the future that connects a surprisingly large fraction of the CS community. Eric's early research career intersected with my own. Those of us who were involved in computer science research in the late 70s and early 80s know that we were extremely fortunate to be working at places like Princeton or Stanford or Bell Labs or Xerox PARC. It was an exciting time, uh, and Eric was certainly a, a leading participant. We were changing the world, and we knew it. My own opinion is that Turing and von Neumann had that same feeling 40 years earlier, and that today's students have that same feeling 40 years later. I think that Eric would be proud to be called a geek. Uh, I know that there are more than a few geeks in this audience. <laughs> Uh, geeks know that Lex is a really cool piece of software <laughs> and that Eric developed it at Bell Labs with Mike Lesk. Mike Lesk. Uh, if you're not a geek or if you're 30 years old or younger, maybe you thought that the concept of someone developing a cool piece of software and then winding up running a leading technology company is something new. Not really. It's not enough just to wind up as a CEO. The steady growth, growth at an unprecedented rate of Google from a successful startup to one of the world's biggest and best companies that will lead us all into the future has been nothing short of amazing and a testimony to Eric Schmidt's unique talent and experiences. While ostensibly about the past, this event is really about the future. Turing and his generation brought us the computer as we know it. A generation later, 10 times as many people, including Eric Schmidt, brought us the computational infrastructure that surrounds us. And what will today's students, 10 times again as many, bring us? I know that Eric is a person that appreciates the core values that lie at the heart of this celebration. That investment in basic research, as Princeton did in mathematics in the 20th century, always pays off that computer science has completely transformed the world over the past several decades and is poised to do so again, and that our students are going to build a future that we can only strive to imagine. Indeed, Eric Schmidt is a person that exemplifies these values, and I'm proud to present him to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Robert. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm here both to talk to you, but also to be in the presence of the giants that I owe credit to, who happen to be sitting in the front rows here. These were the faculty members that I encountered as a 22-year-old showing up at Princeton. 18-year-old, excuse me. And, <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot. And it's been a long time. And by the way, it's not 40 years, it's 30 years, but let's get the, <laughs> let's get the, let's get the math right. <laughs> but in any case, in any case, um, uh, we have among us the people who were icons to me as a young computer scientist, people who laid out the groundwork for many of the concepts. And we were talking at dinner that one of the most interesting things about computer science at that time was that you could almost know it all because there were just enough people that you could talk to every one of them, and they were so incredible. And if you love computer science in the way that I did, it was this extraordinary period. Now, of course, computer science is much more complicated. When I came to Princeton, there was no computer science department. It was a double E department, and they were very nice, but I really wanted to work on computers. And we ended up using a computer called an IBM 360 91. 
the old timers here know how venerable a machine this was. And I want, for those of you who want to understand, it's, it was literally the fastest computer that I had ever encountered. It had all of one megabyte. <laughs> megabyte, and the megabyte was the size of you know, roughly this big. It was, of course, water-cooled, made out of iron core. Um, all, unfortunately, most of those 360s were literally sold because the contents were so valuable as minerals. But you can, but one of the more interesting things that happened during that period is a, a group of us, including a fellow named Tom Lyon, myself, and a couple of others, did the first port of Unix to a non-PDP architecture machine, which then set in motion the ultimate licensing and set of activities that brought Unix to where it is today. So when I think about my sort of small component about being at Princeton and the contributions that Princeton made, and I think about what's possible now with the kind of computation that's possible now and the kinds of things that you all can do uh, in an interconnected world, it's, it's just extraordinary to have the privilege of being part of this at any age. And then I think about what can be done, going back to what Bob said, when I think about what can be done now 30 plus years later, Think about the scale and the platforms that have been built, starting with the genius of Turing and Oppenheimer, the geniuses of the people that I learned from, again, present here in the room, and then the people that you have a privilege of listening to now, the people who look pretty young to me, who were in fact full professors here at Princeton, who got there because they're just so incredibly smart. What I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about, about sort of the future and let's start by, by there's a quote from, Alan, from, from Turing that I liked. Machines take me by surprise with great frequency. And that's my life every day. And I think it's true of most people in the world today. I, I have no excuse. I should be able to predict this stuff, all the things that you can do. But most people are just in awe of what's been possible over these platforms. And what's interesting is that we, we have a kind of arrogance in our own mind, because we say everyone has a smartphone. Everyone here has a smartphone, right? I hope you have an Android phone, but that is OK. <laughs> you yeah, have an iPhone, it's OK, a Blackberry. But, but in fact, everyone does not have a smartphone. There's less than a billion people in the world who have smartphones, on the order of two billion who have computationally interesting phones, right? They're called WAP phones, where are the phones, right? <laughs> Uh, sorry, that's a science joke. And there's another five or so billion that are not connected. And what I want to talk about is what happens when those people all get interconnected. Because I think that's, that's when things really start to roll. So, so what's interesting is that, that for each person online today, if you look at the numbers, there's two that are not. We've not heard from them. We don't really know what they're doing. So for most people, for the majority of humans on the planet, the digital revolution has not arrived yet. It's like shocking. It's like you've grown up with it. How can that be true? But it is true. And so in my mind, I think of a set of groups. And I want to start with a group which I'm going to call a privileged few, an elite, whatever word you want to describe. And these are people, I think us in particular, who will experience the world in an ultra-connected way. These are early adopters, you know, computer scientists, developers, startup founders, people who work for the organizations that make this stuff happen. And for this group, the future offers as a limit only what science can deliver and what is legal and permissible. That is literally what is possible before us because of the technology that's ahead of us. And with this technological augmentation of our lives every day, you get a sense of what is now possible. Now, everybody here knows, but I'll repeat for the record, Moore's law doubling, uh, computational power doubling roughly every two years, plus or minus. There are other laws that are equally interesting. The cost of computer storage per gigabyte is halving every 14 months, right? So you wonder what you're gonna do with your pictures. Well, there's more and more space to store them. Um, so we can look at, at a future of almost unlimited speed and processing power, at least for the group that I'm talking about. So in that model, you have intelligence sensors and everything. You know, everything has an IP address. You're wearing five or six IP addresses per unit of time, all this kind of stuff. And this new, and the, the really interesting thing is that an intelligent infrastructure emerges 
the sensor, the combination of data telemetry, uh, sensors, and all of the other kinds of things allow us literally to do things knowing where things are. I mean, I'm still excited when the, the parking lot guy says there's a parking spot on the third floor. That's how, that's how modest my ambitions are. Well, imagine when we have the kind of real-time tele telemetry all driven by the presence of phones and other devices for what people are actually doing and what they want. All the estimates indicate that by about 2020, true fiber optic networks will be available at least in the urban centers in the Western world. And by true fiber optics, I mean a gigabit. I don't mean a half a gigabit or a hundred megabits or whatever. The technology, of course, will go much faster, but that's a pretty nice big round number. And at a gigabit, all of the distinctions of, mem of uh, media, you know, HD movies and radio and television, all disappear. It's just bits all sorts of concomitant impl implications for business models, distribution, and incumbents. We're already seeing science fiction come out. I think about Star Trek or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We already have automatic translation. We have voice-to-voice -voice translation now. What happens is you speak into your phone, it's translated to text, the text is translated into the other language text, and then a voice synthesizer puts it out. All done in real time by a super set of supercomputers that you don't have no idea where they are, right? Voice recognition, the same thing. The quality of voice recognition is really, really scary. Right? Shows you how, how much progress the AI folks have made. Look at electronic books. Right? The majority of books sold today are electronic. Shock to me, but it's true. So, so the people who now talk about the possibility of holograms, virtual reality, all of the other things, are almost certainly right. They're present in the labs. The underlying computational and distribution capabilities are going to be there. There's plenty of people working on it. Driverless cars. Isn't it obvious that the car should drive you? <laughs> it never gets drunk and it never gets lost, <laughs> right? And if it's properly designed, it doesn't hit anything, right? And we're busy getting, you know, driverless car driver licenses and things like that. We, of course, in order to promote this idea, took a gentleman who was a willing participant um, a blind man and had him drive the car. What we didn't tell you, of course, is there was a police car behind just to make sure everything was fine. <laughs> but the important point was this stuff is coming. And in our lifetimes, you're going to see, we in this sort of connected elite, if you will, we're going to see all this happen. You know, so you think about it, what does this mean? It means that I don't have to make these sort of bizarre choices. You know, do you go to your daughter's soccer game or do you do, go to the rock concert? Well, you send your virtual robot to the rock concert and then at home after you've gotten bored watching the soccer game, you put in your haptic gloves, you put on your uh, earphones, you have a nice big screen and you have that experience of the rock concert. And then when your daughter comes and hits you on the shoulder, you know, you come back from the rock concert. You think this is not possible? Of course it's possible. People are doing this today. The difference is that in the next five to 10 years, it'll become commonplace in the same way that talking on your cell phone while you're walking down the street is now commonplace. It's the same thing. So, so the big change that underlies this in computer science is, is generally known as the big data revolution. And because we have so much data coming in, I'm using the word telemetry and so forth, we can do data analytics, discover new markets, discover new, new preferences, and know things. And with new developments in AI, we can predict things. So we can predict, for example, there's going to be a traffic jam at two o'clock at this intersection because we've seen it before. We've seen those patterns before. This, again, is the promise of computer science. So if you think about it, governments should actually be able to spot the economic makings of a crisis that they're already making, right? Somebody should say, hey guys, right, you're just about to have a collapse. And then the government will debate the presence of a collapse <laughs> for a while, right? But it makes sense, right? Computers is early warning for, for human error. Um, doctors should be able to predict, accurately predict the outbreaks of diseases for the same reason, because they'll see it, they'll see the wave, and there are technology to do this today. Can you imagine a situation where teachers can measure whether teaching actually works and then iterate until they get the teaching right? Right? What a concept. New startups, both nonprofit and, prof and for profit, are doing that. We might actually discover new ways of teaching some children, or maybe most children. Clearly, we all benefit from that. At the core level, technology in this model disappears. The web will be everything, and it will also be nothing. It literally becomes a part of the fabric of our lives. When? The next five to 10 years. Hmm. There's a second group. I call these sort of the connected contributors. This is, if you will, the digital middle class. 
These are the people who want what I just described, but for whatever reason, they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the money or whatever, but they're gonna participate. These people win too. Um, in their case, they, they've grown up with an expectation of broadband, like, like all middle classes, they have an expectation of better things, but we're delivering it. In this case, for example, you can have holo presence, it's easy enough. Imagine being able to stand among the street performers in Marrakesh or imagine being in the square when North Korea has its first democratic election and the ability to feel that and ex experience it through some sort of projection in your home. Easy to do with enough bandwidth. And the cloud, right, which I've talked, hinted a little bit, becomes essential to these people's world, right? Everything you have is in the cloud, your businesses start in the cloud. B small businesses are the majority driver of new employment and new education um, in, in our country and most of the Western world. So, and in, in fact, in the developing world as well. So all of a sudden, the cloud begins to enable rapid, more rapid formation of new businesses, new opportunities, and new entrepreneurship. And, and it's pretty clear to me that there's sort of a divide in that world between the guys who sort of build and the people who buy. Let's say it's 90-10, 10% who, who, who build these systems and 90% who sort of consume or buy them. With the emergence of a maker society, many people have heard about this, most physical devices can be made by now these automated computer devices that actually will you know, build this piece of plastic or metal for you, leading to increases in specialization and other kinds of things like that. But from my perspective, this network that this community is building is more than a set of objects. It's more than a set of data. I like to think of it as evolving into a collective intelligence and sort of a global conscience. And the unique aspect of the internet is it allows you to be an individual while also participating in this collective consciousness. That's what's so special about it. You can be you, you can be what you care about. You can make your own product and have your own beliefs and have your own colors or set up your own school of yourself, right? Not very exciting, but you could do it. And you could also participate in this global conscience in this community and move us forward together. That's what an architecture that computer scientists built allows. It's this brilliant notion of scalability. But I've only talked about the minority. I've only talked about the first billion or two. I haven't talked about the most important group, which is the majority. Now, the reality is that for the next decade, those people are not going to be as connected as we are going to be fortunate enough to. Why? Well, one, they're in a war zone. Two, they have higher priorities. Three, the governments are corrupt. Four, it does take some work of infrastructure. And five, they're just not very organized. Okay, kind of bleak picture, right? Well, how do we fix that? Well, there are computer scientists, some in this room, who've worked on mesh networks. And a mesh network is a network that doesn't have a center where you can go from machine to machine to machine in a particular kind of mesh. So people will build phones that can serve as a mesh. How did people get information when the, when, the, uh, when the Egyptian government shut down the network for four and a half days, which is, by the way, an error? Uh, how did people get information out? They handed information out in the equivalent of a mesh network. Or they used uh, technologies that Google and others built called Speak to Tweet, where you could make a phone call, and it would be turned into a digital record. It, wasn't, it was a mistake for many reasons, but the biggest mistake was that the average Egyptian was sitting there at home saying, oh my God, they've shut off the internet. <laughs> Something really important must be happening. <laughs> and, I, and I kid you not. <laughs> so in this model, there's a huge growth of data centers in countries like China and Turkey and some of the other Asian markets in Southeast Asia. And the fiber optic connections happen. But how does the average person get access? Well, it's interesting that even if they are completely unconnected, that last billion that will sort of never really be inter interconnected, at least for a while, they'll get devices that have enough memory that they'll have a high school education plan on them, just stored on them. So all of a sudden, their phone, which they're so obsessed about, is also their educational device and their entertainment device. That's why the advances in disk memory, storage, and so forth are so profound. We think of it because we can store even more copies of pictures of ourselves. That's not why it's really so important. What's really important is because you can get all of the world's knowledge that they need to know in their language on these devices. 
or more likely, one set of knowledge and automatically translate it into whatever language they speak. Think about it, it's extraordinary. So, so what happens, of course, is this sort of DSL level activity occurs. The vast majority experience this network in a wireless way. And they don't necessarily have a three, everyone talks about expanding 4G networks. We have enough trouble getting them built in the United States, guys. The fact of the matter is that for the majority of these people, they'll have interesting hobble, um, interesting hobble together networks. They'll have, for example, a single connection to a village, which will have a Wi-Fi connection. And then they'll use voice over IP from their phone to the Wi-Fi connection so that they can do locally routed calls. And all of these things will happen. Why do I know? Because every single example that I've used is one that I know people working on. And I know that technology will then, and what I also know, and I think is obvious, is that people want to be connected. Every single principle of my entire uh, computer science career can be understood by the simple observation is that people want to be connected. And if they're this connected, they want to be more connected. So in this case, even if the data connections don't work, you still have SMS as a backup. You still have other ways to do it. And everyone's going to use that stuff. So if you think of this as building a digital water hole, watering hole, and think about what happens when a device like this shows up in a place that's never had a textbook, has never had access to the equivalent of national news, has never had access to the other world's languages. Think about how important that is. Think about it. it's life changing. We take it for granted. Oh, I have a new phone. Oh, I'm so excited and so forth. For them, it's the difference literally between life and death. And all of a sudden, we can start to build systems. So for example, we want to give out bed nets, SMS us when you get one. That way we deal with some of the corruption issues. I'll give you another example. Most of the third world has corruption issues. What's the simplest way of doing the, dealing with that? Transparency. Get the people who are running the government to list all of their assets and then ask the citizens to find the hidden ones. They know where they are. Right? And then, by the way, give them an, an encrypted portal where they can anonymously submit that information so that the police don't come and shoot them. Right? By the way, this is what's happening. And if you look at, if you look at each of the governments that's figuring this out, when you actually make this proposal, they all go like this, and then they work very hard to prevent it. <laughs> because they know it's the end of their money line. So one of the great things about this connectedness is we can solve lots of problems. The overwhelming benefit of what has been built, again, starting with Mr. Turing, Mr. Oppenheimer, and all of that, is that we can begin to solve some of the core problems in the world. The technology is not neutral. It is, excuse me, it is neutral, it's not all positive. There are some issues that the technology creates, but it's overwhelmingly beneficial. And in any case, you're not going to stop it. So you might as well get behind it and figure out a way to build the companies and the technology that will make this happening. And what's interesting, if you think about it, the technology that I'm talking about will be a sort of a leveler. The, the weak will be made strong just because of the connectedness. And those with nothing will have something, which for them is even more important than what we see before us. It's an extraordinarily positive message from their perspective. So, so in conclusion, and sort of, I think, I think Bob, you wanted to sort of do questions and comments on this or anything else. Um, every revolution starts with a small group of people. Shocking. You know, you think that it takes a thousand people to do something? No, it takes two. And then they hire the next 998. It's always true. Every great thing that I've encountered has started with an idea of one person, two, two people, three people, and they did it in such a way that they hit it just right, a combination of luck and skill and perhaps some chutzpah, and they made it happen. When I think about the revolution that I'm talking about, it literally started in the 1930s here. And I, and I hope that they had some idea, you never know, did they have under, some idea of the kind of scalability that they were building? that the magic of Hamming codes and Turing's equivalence problems and so forth and so on, all the work done here in the Institute of Advanced Study and so forth. And I think that, that in our case, we have to acknowledge that these people gave us these opportunities. And I think that from my perspective, what is the most humbling for me of all is the sense that we're just beginning, and I say you are just beginning, 
to have something of a boundless capacity that's sort of the connected humanity that we will create. It's extraordinary. So thank you very much. Thank you. Do yeah, people have comments or, or questions? Yeah, Eric has agreed to take yeah. some questions. There's microphones. Dana Scott. <laughs> you spoke about Oppenheimer, but I think you really meant for Neumann. Excuse me. <laughs> you were always like this when I worked for you. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really wanted to ask you is, we've become a throwaway society. All this amazing manufacturing will just make us throw away more things. In the third world, you can't throw away things. Don't you think we should train people to repair and to understand how things work? Um, I do. One of the more interesting things about phones is if you spend some time in the developing world, every person you speak with has read the manual for their phone. <laughs> they know every single feature. And the average person here hasn't read it and doesn't care and knows they get a new phone in the next six months. So I, I completely agree. Um, there's a set of issues, I think, with in, in the developing world. The most obvious one has to do with the, ba the structure of batteries, right? And how do, we, how do we get them to have longer lives, the throwaway society, and so forth, and also how we, how we, how we uh, charge them. And there's a lot of good progress there. Uh, so you, you mentioned earlier that we can help predict financial prices with technology, but how do we solve our current, uh, how do we solve some of our current uh, economic problems right now, such as social security and health care. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, uh, there, there's, uh, there's, there's a pledge that I ask my friends and politicians to give. And I'd like you to, um, let's see if I can do this right. I'll come up with, I'll, I'll, I'll do the pledge in a slightly different way. These, the, the people we are electing don't care about facts. They care about getting reelected. As long as we allow that, we deserve the government we have, right? It's true, it's true for the lot as a group. I spend lots of time with them. They're busy suing us the whole bit. So um, <laughs> if you look at Europe, the European problem is, is a structural problem. They built a, they, they built a system that you could go in, but you could not go out. So they essentially created a new gold standard. So they have a different set of problems. But I think um, the European problem affects us a great deal because of the interconnectedness of these markets. Um, if you look at the Euro, most of those things are not technological problems. They were simply system design problems. If you look at the United States, if you look at it as a system design problem, there's so many checks and balances in the American system and so many ways to get to say no, that it's very difficult to sort of navigate. And that's what everybody's so frustrated with. The best thing you could do is look at the Simpson-Bowles Commission, which basically has the best facts that I can figure out. And this, the US situation for Social Security is pretty good. And the situation for healthcare overall is terrible. So the way I translate your question is, Let's try not to have any more unfunded wars, because that adds a trillion dollars of debt. Let's try not to have any glo more global financial crises, because that added somewhere between one and five trillion dollars of debt, depending on who you add. And then let's figure out a way to, to have manageable healthcare cost growth, because today it's unmanageable. The problem with those, the latter is those are so politically difficult, because people don't even agree on the facts. So, so I asked the politicians to say, and I'll ask you, uh, you know, in God we trust, all, other da all others have to bring data. <laughs> so, it works pretty well. Yeah. More, more questions? There's lots of questions. Go ahead. Doesn't matter. My co author. <laughs> We're here to celebrate Turing, and of course, we're lucky to have many Turing Award winners here. Now, when you go to the general and public- And for those of you who don't know, Turing Award is the top, it's the Nobel Prize of our field. 
exactly what I was going to say, yeah. and exactly what you have to say. Right? So there's an easy way to fix this, and Google could do it. Rename. Create a Nobel Prize in computing. It would require, it would require the, f the, the permission of the Nobel family. They did it for economics. Ah, OK. Go and do it for computing. You could Thank do you. it. Thank you. Thank you. This, this would solve. This would, this would solve the problem of all, of all of our overseas cash. <laughs> OK, anyway, next question. Thank you, Phil. Hi, um, thank you very much for your speech, and it's an honor to have you here. Um, so thank you for your time talking about connectivity. And I thought that's something really interesting that Google's doing, of course, is Google Wallet, and how currency is becoming a huge issue, not only in the first world countries, but in third world countries as well. So I come from Korea, where uh, we already have money, money on our cell phones, and we pay for it in uh, convenience stores, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I was wondering what you think is the future for currency and digital currency, because we have so many social currencies going around. And uh, yeah. Well, I proposed um, that Google should have its own currency called Google Bucks. Uh, and unfortunately, I found out it's illegal to create your own currency. Um, but, but we tried. Um, so um, the technical answer, of course, as you know, is that this new generation of phones all have a, a chip called the NFC chip. And the NFC chip allows you to sort of get near something, and then there's a digital essentially a digital element inside the phone that uniquely identifies the phone, and off of that you key the equivalent of a digital wallet. And I think everybody, and especially in Korea, has sort of agreed that that's the future of the technology. There's a very, very successful startup in America called Square, which has a slightly different model of how this will work. It's worth taking a look at. But I think most people agree that, uh, that the scenario you describe in Korea, which I've been to, where you pay with everything with the equivalent of your phone, will happen here too. I don't know quite why it's been so slow here. I think partly because it's so unmanaged, whereas in countries like Korea, it was much more top down. But I do agree. Um, once you have everything in these digital wallets, there's lots of things that are possible. But to me, the most interesting thing is it solves a lot of the things on the edges. Most countries, are, most countries that is not the US and not Korea, have significant corruption problems. Now you can track the money. The money doesn't get where you're trying to go to. Uh, an example would be, let's say you want, you're in, a, in our country and you want to change, um, the oil prices are too low. And the oil prices are kept low because it's a monopoly government and they don't want unrest. Well, the only way to really do that is to take the subsidy, right, have the citizens pay more for oil, but then you have to transfer the money directly to them. This is the only way that they'll actually support what you're doing. So there are lots of new things that you can do when you can talk directly to a voter or to a consumer with something that matters to them, which is money. Yes, a question over here. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Wherever you want. The, the, the lady in the back. She's. I think the one, there's one over there. I'm over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, um, sir. You, you're talking about how everything's in the next five to ten years, all these new technologies and new ways to use the current technology. How are you know those of us that are older um, going to? You're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm older than he is, and he's doing stuff on his computer that I can't even imagine doing. I don't understand it. I don't want to become the digital equivalent of my parents who are still using dial-up and AOL. So how, how are we going to learn and progress as the technology progresses? Ask him. <laughs> um, as a general comment, student, uh, children at, at the sort of year and a half to two years are able to use iconic you literally manipulate icons in their games and so forth and so on. I don't think any of us have any idea what that's going to lead in terms of, in terms of their creativity and so forth. But we know it's very, very significant, so they spend all their time on it. If you have a child, your child is either asleep or they're online. That's how profound this change is. <laughs> right, so I think about the years spending sitting around here in the sort of sweltering heat of Princeton, right, where I was not at all connected. And I think about how different it would be today. Um, there's reasons to be hopeful, though, that computer science started as sort of a, a, sort of a low, low engineering level of, of sort of the, think of it as the engine room programming problem. And the new generation of tools and techniques are incredibly consumer focused. So take a look at Instagram, just bought by Facebook for a billion dollars, which is a lot of money. Uh, why? It's incredibly easy to use. So the hope for you and me and others who do not have the benefit of being so young is that these young people are making systems that are simpler for us. 
some more questions. Over. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, you said in your speech that um, that the internet is is special and important because you can be an individual and participate in a wider community. How is that different than just living in the world? The difference is that most people live in a local context, and historically, society has always been very local. And if you look over a thousand years. The progress of society has been local, bigger local, bigger local, bigger local, and now global. Uh, the fact of the matter is that a single individual can affect, for good or bad, the discussion on a billion people or a hundred million people or so forth. That was never possible before. In the same sense that Amazon took the idea of a physical bookstore and made a bookstore that was bigger than any physical bookstore you could have, your reach as an individual is simply bigger. The consequence of that is that you have bigger stars. Right? So you, you, go, you don't have a regional star. You have a national or a global star. It also, by the way, benefits uh, universities like Princeton because Princeton's reputation is no longer just in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut when I was here, but the national in the 1990s, and now it's global. That trend to globalization is, a, is an effect of the connectedness of the world. What I'm particularly interested in is I want to hear from all these people we haven't heard from. How many brilliant people that are stuck somewhere in some bad government who can't talk to us, I want to hear from them. Brilliant in, in the arts, brilliant in science, brilliant in ideas, or just crazy. They've got to be fun. <laughs> more, uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Um, yes, yeah, you talked a lot about the, um, uh, the role of technology and technology companies in promoting uh, economic growth and um, democratic progression in um, developing countries. And I just wondered what you see as the role specifically of Google in all of this. Uh, well, I didn't want to turn this into a Google talk. Um, we, uh, Google's, well, the internet has a huge impact on developing countries because of the core connectedness things. And in our case, we have lots of services for the creation of small businesses. Again, you think about a local business in a developing country, all of a sudden now has a larger market. They have more information uh, because they can, they can try to figure out how they price and so forth. There are a lot of evidence, for example, that once rice farmers get interconnected, the rice prices go up slightly because they get better pricing signals and their distributors are not quite capable of, of pounding on them as much as they have. There are lots of reasons to think that, that that connectedness benefits. In our case, we flow some number of tens of billions of dollars in terms of creating new jobs in that area. Uh, the other thing that we're doing that other countries are doing is well, we're spending a lot of money on getting the basic broadband infrastructure that circles the, road in the world in place. There are, are areas where the fiber optic connectivity to literally between the countries is quite poor, and we need to get that fixed if we want to hear from these people. Some more questions? Who's over here? Um, you, uh, you mentioned uh, your curiosity about whether or not Nick uh, Turing and von Neumann thought about scalability in terms of the future. And I'm wondering what you think about um, the effect that advancements in technology are going to have on developed worlds such as this country where there's a lot of people who have jobs that are not skilled or very, very specified and how that's going to affect the future of the economy, say, in this country. This is a hot topic of, of debate right now. Um, the people in our political leadership who think that education doesn't matter should get out of politics. Uh, that's how strongly I believe. Because the our workforce can't go back to manual labor on the farms. It's not going to happen. So the only way that we're going to continue to be successful as a country economically with real GDP growth is by creating new jobs. So let's go through this. Job creation is roughly two-thirds of jobs in the U.S. are created by small, fast-growing business. Roughly one-third are created by larger companies which are growing. The majority of large companies sort of cancel each other out. The ones that the large companies that are growing tend to be multinationals. So one thing to think about it is that you all as a group should either end up in a fast growing multinational or in a small business that's growing fairly quickly. Anything that we can do that accelerates the creation of new small businesses in any area is net positive on a jobs basis. Now, what's why it seems everybody says, well, that's so obvious, right? Well, if it's so obvious, why is it so hard for them to get any funding at all? to get their ideas and so forth. And yet the big businesses, which are growing quite slowly, can get the funding. This is one of the issues in the current recovery. So the, so the sum of it is, the sum of the prescription, if you will, is the only solution we have is to fund in some form creation in the private sector of new small companies. Now, where will they be? 
Let me give you an example. Um, natural gas prices are the lowest they've been in a couple of decades. Natural gas prices are so low that uh, the industry as a whole has sort of figured out some way to limit their production because prices were literally making things uneconomic. That's how, that's how much of a problem there is. Why did this occur? It's called innovation. A series of developments in fracking uh, and other technologies in better yield, and we can debate whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but the fact of the matter is it was a technological breakthrough that changed this. And all of a sudden, there's a whole different energy conversation in America. All of the, the coal plants are gonna have to get rebuilt. So now we have an opportunity to have innovation, entrepreneurship, and a whole new business in something which I'm not an expert in. There are plenty of such examples. But we have to get the, the bias right. And one more thing since I have the soapbox, is there's this belief that somehow the private sector is the only party doing this. And I'm obviously a business person and a member of the private sector. It's important to know that the Silicon Valley Revolution was started by government funding in the 40s and 50s that virtually all of the infrastructure that I encountered when I w went to Berkeley after being here and all the companies that were based on sort of the infrastructure and the initial investment for other purposes. So don't forget, it's not just the internet that government funding created. It's also a culture of science, a focus on this, and of course the great research in institutions benefited very heavily from government funding. Don't forget it. Some more comments. Um, I think no one can doubt that leadership and the style of leadership has been changed by technology since the printing press first came in. Sure. And uh, certainly, Mr. Turing had much different uh, styles of leadership uh, over him throughout society than uh, we do now. With the new technology, some of which you've unveiled and hinted at, uh, what do you see as the changes in the way business leaders and social political leaders will, will, uh, will be like and what they'll be doing? I don't think we know. Um, one of the questions is you think about business people 50 years ago, there are two core differences. One is the absence of smoking <laughs> and the second one is the presence of women, both of which I think are clear improvements. Uh, do you think that people's personalities and the way people behave have changed much in 50 years? I don't think so. I think what's happened is that they use different tools, but you still see the same archetypes. The sort of collaborative leader, the despotic leader, the I'm in charge leader and you're not, the, you know, all of these different leadership styles. And I think that in the field of organizational behavior, there's a, a growing sense that to do things of significance, you have to end up having people organize in teams, but it's an open question how those teams are managed, I think, if you look at the sort of literature. My own view is that to achieve the vision that this gentleman asked, asked about, we're going to have to figure out sort of standard ways of managing smart creative people. And that smart creative people won't just do what they're told. They actually have to be at least listened to before you tell them what they have to do, <laughs> right? In Google's case, we have a model derived again from university model where the average empl the technical employee, it's true for all of them, can spend 20% of their time on whatever they want to work on. Now these are engineers, don't worry. They work kind of in the same area. <laughs> but anyway, out of this 20% time, a lot of innovation has come up. My guess is that if you look at the innovative industries in the United States, they all have some aspect of that. Because the fact of the matter is that innovation does not come from a single individual or even the top executives in a company and that the more traditional the company is, the more hierarchical it is, the more tradition-bound it is, and the more less innovative it is. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, so I'm just speaking from personal experience here. When Princeton lost the internet earlier this year for about a day, a lot of the students found it to be kind of a catastrophic experience. Everything <sighs> that we have is online. Um, as we talk about getting more and more connected, how are we gonna prevent problems that arise from becoming um, kind of panic-inducing? <laughs> so you have to tell me what happened for the day that you did not have the internet. Uh -huh. Did you actually have to talk to people in person <laughs> and have a conversation in the dorm and visit each other's rooms and actually figure out where they actually lived? <laughs> well, all of our homework was online and the professor- Oh no, you couldn't do your homework. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, what a calamity. 
You're not making very much progress <laughs> with your question. I'm just saying that I personally, and I think many of my friends, when we don't have internet and we don't have email, are very much, like, very lost, yeah. <laughs> There's a, just to dig a hole, a deeper hole. Uh, <laughs> There's something called random positive reinforcement in psychology, and it's where with a dog, where you give the dog at an unpredictable rate a, a, a treat or not. So now let's consider junk mail and email. Oh, I have an email for me. Oh, it's a junk mail, and you wait for a while. Oh, I have an email for me. Oh, junk mail, junk mail, junk mail, and you wait for a while. This drives our brains crazy, and this is at the root of your problem. <laughs> The, the serious answer is that the internet, in my fantasy, the internet will never break because it's too critical. And I think one of the consequences of, if you think about this, so much of our, our lives, and, and I mean life safety, critical safety, obviously entertainment and education, and the systems are getting powerful enough and redundant enough that I think that this terrible calamity that you will remember for the rest of your life <laughs> will not repeat in graduate school or in other places. I think it's sort of, sort of over. More questions. I think a question. Um, I was going to ask, what do you think uh, in regard to quantum computing in the future? Do you, um, do you have any thoughts we, on that? We have some actual inventors of quantum computing in the audience, and so I will probably screw this up, um, <laughs> but I'll try anyway. Um, there's a there's a there's a set of chips that are now being built that have so many bits, and they're called qubits. And these qubits are like 100, 100 bits or 200 bits, 500 bits, those kinds of numbers. So these are small number of bits. But they have the property that they behave in a quantum state, which means that I don't understand what they're doing, um, <laughs> and that you have to program them in a very, very different way. But there's a set of problems which can be computed in parallel with quantum computing that cannot otherwise. Uh, there's a set of research initiatives, and we've studied them pretty thoroughly, um, which over the next few years will lead quantum computers of sufficient performance to, I think, prove that some of these algorithms will work. And I think over a reasonably long period of time, it's going to be fascinating. The core issue with quantum computing is everything has to be basically at 0 0.03 Kelvin or something like this. So they're very, very cold devices. And I think of computers as being hot, right? So there's a whole bunch of issues around the storage and handling and how you program these things. So it'll be a long term. Too, it's too early to tell. There have been many, many such ideas. This one is, I think, the most radical. Uh, a lot of people have made arguments that there will be successors to CMOS uh, into the underlying computing. And so far, CMOS has gotten better and better. Um, and I think it's a, it'll be a long time before we'll know whether quantum computing will get there. But I think for the, for the foreseeable planning horizon for all of us, you're going to see improvements in CMOS down to sort of you know, 0.13 nan nanometer kinds of things and with lots and lots of parallelism. So the way they'll keep Moore's law going is they'll just go parallel, parallel, parallel. One of the key things, for those of you that are not computer scientists, computer scientists are good with two things, scalability and parallelism. If you just remember those two things, you can pass any of the courses. <laughs> and that's, by the way, why these systems, when you implement them, they grow so well. And that's, I think, the magic of CS. A bunch of questions here. Who's next? So you, you, you talked a lot of uh, technology in the future, for example, by 2020. So I'm curious if those technologies are related to Google X Lab. So can you talk a little, about, a little bit more about the Google X Lab and uh, how can you get in Google X? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, someone leaked the details of a lab that was allegedly quite secret at Google called Google X. And so we did release some of the information. Uh, Google X is the lab that built the self-driving cars. It's run by a, a computer scientist named Sebastian Thrun, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, the Google goggles that um, have recently been shown were developed there as well. Can't talk about some of the other ones, but imagine the union of computer science and hardware and new devices along the ways that I've been talking about, and you'll get a sense of what we're working on. Uh, more questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh. I, I was just wondering um, how you balance your personal and work life. There is no balance. 
This lady had balance for that day. <laughs> my, my, my actual advice is that there is an off button. Learn how to use it. <laughs> this is really, really difficult. So I know it's difficult, and I want you to practice. At dinner tomorrow night, I want you to turn off from the, from the salad through the entree. OK. <laughs> and presumably, you're dealing with somebody else look at them in their eyes and talk to them. <laughs> now, at Google, when we built the team, I, I tried an experiment, and I, I regret to say that I decided that we had to have 60 minutes per week of not using your computer. And those 60 minutes were the 60 minutes in front of me in our staff meeting. So what would happen is people would, I would yell at them with their, so they would get their Blackberries and now Android phones and they would do it surreptitiously under the table. <laughs> so when Larry replaced me a year ago, he gave up. So we couldn't even get people to give up one hour a week. So I, that's why my challenge for salad to dinner is such a difficult challenge. But that's how I would do it. Because if you, if, you, if you don't have some, and the reason I'm obviously being facetious, you need, your brain needs some downtime. And I, w there's a lot of evidence that this constant interruption is in fact bad for us. Some of the sort of the deeper thinking and so forth is in fact affected. So you want to allow for that. More questions? Who? Yes, sir. Um, I yes, have a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. I have a question about um, K through 12 education. I was just wondering if you had any uh, thoughts about what changes, if any, you'd like to see in yeah. K through 12 education so that um, more of us become producers rather than consumers of technology? I, I will say that, and I'll get in trouble with this, but that's okay, um, that there's a lot of evidence that the educational establishment and its leadership runs the educational system for the benefit of the adults and not the children. If you ran the educational system for the benefit of the children, you would test what you do, you'd iterate, you'd try different models, you'd be flexible, the teachers would self-organize around new teaching models because teachers want to teach really well. But the, the legal structure, the management structure, the union structure, the government funding structure, the sum of it conspires to prevent any change whatsoever because we like it the way it is, even though it's produced a huge problem. Princeton is fortunate enough to have access to the top students in the world, but not everybody is so fortunate. I'm an advisor to the Khan Academy. If you, if you don't know about the Khan Academy, you should. It's written, uh, founded by this uh, very generous fellow named Sal Khan, who gave up his career on Wall Street to work on this. He does these 10-minute videos. And his idea is to flip the model, flip the classroom. So you, when you go home, you watch the videos. And in the classroom, with the teacher, you do the problem solving. And then he has a set of games and interactive things to tra track progress. He has remarkable results. The most interesting results so far is that if you look at a student in a typical sort of 10-year-old, 11-year-old kind of math class, something relatively straightforward, the math is organized around knowledge levels. And if you don't get this part, you lose the rest of your year. And so he can now show algorithmically that if you take the time with that student, which a classroom can't, but an individual instruction can, that student can not only overcome the thing that's holding them back, but they can actually beat the other people later which is a remarkable result. So if this stuff holds up, it will change the world. And we need as many such experiments as we can. Yes, sir. Yeah, Eric, first, a little bit of bad news. I showed up here in 1972 also, and it was indeed 40 years ago, not 30. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to be the one to break that, break that to you. Um, you talked a little bit about transparency in government and the benefits of more transparency in government. But there's such a thing as too much transparency. I'll talk a mo moment about the private sector. This past summer, the SOPA-PIPA fight uh, was, represents a collision uh, in the private sector of the need for more transparency in the eyes of some and the, and the need for less in the eyes of others. Another example of that is intellectual property theft and the whole issue of cybersecurity. Can you talk a little bit about where you see the fronts in this war developing over the next decade, the collision between people who want everything to be open and those who perhaps have economic or other interests in not having everything be open? So um, I, I think I understand the question you asked. But for the record, I don't agree with the framing that you said. SOPA and PIPA were not about transparency. They were about essentially 
how the economics of the industries work and how copyright and how theft worked. Um, so I think what you're asking about has to do with this notion of um, the tension between, for purposes of argument, open source and paid for source, the, op the, ten the, the tension between content that's free and supported by other models and content that's sold in, in other ways. I think that's what you're getting at. And the privacy issues. Um, we have, there's a couple of observations that we have to make. The first is that it's now possible to make accurate digital copies of things. And if you take a strategy as a business of withholding the ability to have copies, people will make illegal copies. I'm not endorsing them. This is not an endorsement of that, but it's a real problem. The recording industry has sort of figured this out and now are moving to models where they try to, to make things more generally available and cover the money in other ways. It's a, it's a serious problem because it's a business model in transition. It's not a problem of lack of popularity of the content. It's that the charging model was different. The problem I have with these arguments is I, I think that any strategy that involves saying no to consumers over and over again tends to make it possible or encourages them in some way to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Classic example is the television licensing where the TV shows are licensed to by country, so you have fans globally. Well, if your fan is in Ireland and you don't license it to Ireland because it's too small a market, they're gonna steal, the, they're gonna steal it to watch it because they love your show so much. This is, the, again, the mentality, the Hollywood mentality. So we've gotta come up with uh, some solutions for this. One is a, a, a much better way of getting money to the, con to the content people, right, with better advertising, better targeting, and everybody's working on that, and we are doing that with YouTube and so forth. Uh, I, I think it's gonna be hard to use digital tools to completely prevent copyright theft, which is what everybody would like to, because the bits are just too generic. There's just too many, it's too easy. In the industry, this is known as the analog hole, and there's just too many ways in which the content can be stolen. So I think the reality is whether we like it or not, and I'm not endorsing theft in any way, um, the people are gonna have to adapt to models which have some loss, right? As long as they can make enough money, they'll be okay, and we want them to be, to be okay. We have to give Eric a chance to uh, get on with his life, so maybe just one more question. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, hi. I'm a freshman at Princeton. Um, Congratulations. You are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the fun and, starts. Yeah. And so you're talking about optimism for the future. And I was just curious about um, how optimistic you were about the future when you were a freshman in college. And it's if you can imagine that if you were... Uh, it's actually interesting today. that I entered in um, 1972, 1973, during the um, fuel crisis. And so in December, they decided to shut down the campus because they decided to have the dorms all become 40 degrees, and they kicked us all home because the university had so little money. So I think none of us had a sense and certainly my co colleagues, of any of the things that were gonna happen that were so optimistic. And I think the lesson that I learned is that societies can get themselves into funks. You know, the, and people remember, the older, older folks here remember the energy crisis and you know, even and odd things and so forth. And you know, my brother said, you know, I'll never be able to afford a sports car because the gas will be so expensive. And I said, you know, give me a break. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, so that was my memory. And I don't think the, the sense of optimism at least for me, did not come until there was a sense of the scale of the world and how creative people are. And I didn't know that. So at your age now, entering Princeton, what I would try to remember the most is that the world is full of extraordinarily gifted people and we're getting them connected. And that's a platform for you to learn, create, build, and change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For